We now move on to the next chapter, Babul Imam, the chapter of Imam. Who is the Imam? What are the rulings of the Imam? And he begins by quoting the hadith of Abu Mas'ud al Badri that we already mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who has the most Quran, Ya Ummul Qawma Aqra'uhum li kitabillah. The one who is Aqra, the one who has the better Qira'a. Now, what does it mean, Aqra'uhum li kitabillah? Once upon a time, Aqra'uhum literally meant the one who knows more because the one who knows more will automatically recite more and uh, and the point is all of the sahaba by and large they recited the quran with the proper tajweed because that is their arabic that is their pronunciation so the sahaba's rules of pronunciation are there because that is their language classical arabic nobody needs to teach them tajweed they are speaking arabic in that manner the classical manner so when the Prophet is saying, the one who aqra, the one who has more qira'ah of the Qur'an, the first meaning that comes to mind, the one who is hafiz, or the one who knows more of the Qur'an. But in our times, we have another problem, which the Sahaba did not have. And what is that problem? You can be a hafiz whose tajweed is pathetic. And you can be somebody who knows five surahs whose tajweed is flawless. So we have... A dilemma now, what does aqra'uhum mean? What does aqra'uhum mean? And this is something that our modern scholars and even medieval scholars, they, they tried to uh, extrapolate. And they said that if the person's tajweed is fahish, it's bad, then his amount of memorization is ignored. And we turn to the one who knows how to recite because that is the one who is aqra, better qira'ah. Even if he's not ahfaz, but he is aqra. And if the person's tajweed is acceptable, passes, and the guy who knows less, his tajweed is superb, in this case, the acceptable trumps because he's still the one who has more Quran and it is acceptable. So, in other words, he knows the rules of tajweed. Now, tajweed, you can have perfection and you can have like a, a BB plus, okay? And Alhamdulillah, most of the people who are reading the Qur'an a lot, they are good in tajweed. It is rare to find the expert of tajweed. So the one who's good in tajweed, that is sufficient. We're not having a voice competition when it comes to the imam. We're not even having a tajweed competition when it comes to the imam. If the tajweed is acceptable, and what is acceptable? It means that he knows the, 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 the ghunna, the mudud, he knows the basic makharij, he knows the sad the, from the seen, the dad from the va. Basically, that's when you study tajweed for a little while, you will get these rules. You don't have to become a master. If you know these basics, you have passed, then you will look at, we will look at your amount of Quran. Even if then a very expert in tajweed comes, but he only knows half a juz, one juz, we don't care then. Because we now look at Aqra'uhum, the one who knows the more Qur'an. But, and this is unfortunately very common in our times, there are Hufad who don't even know Tajweed. And they will make major mistakes. And they don't know how to pronounce the Dad or the Dha. Or they make yani, Ghunna or, or Mudud mistakes. Okay, Wala uh, Zwalin, for example. This is not proper tajweed in any sense of the term. So somebody like this, if he's going to come and lead, we don't care even if he's hafiz. We will find somebody who knows acceptable tajweed. Because the person who doesn't know is not aqram li kitabillah. So if they are both the same, they're both hufaz, or they both know five jaws or ten jaws or whatever, then we look at the sunnah. Meaning the sharia, the knowledge of the sharia, fiqh, sunnah, overall. If they're the, both the same in sunnah, then we look at who emigrated earlier. Well, emigration is gone now. Okay? We don't then... So then we look at the one... So what is the purpose of this hadith? The imam should be the one who religiously is the most looked up to. Simple as that. Religiously, the one who has the most respect. So this therefore means that... We will look at overall their knowledge of the Qur'an, their knowledge of the sciences of Islam, their age. Because if somebody, uh, if somebody 
has or two people have similar amounts of knowledge. They're both, let's say, a very s- simple example in most masjids in North America that don't have an imam. So the community is coming together. So therefore, there's nobody that's a specialist in the Sharia. Nobody has studied Islam. Maybe three, four, five people all know a few Jews of the Quran. They're all similar. So then we will even look at age. That if Islamically they're all similar, Quran-wise they're all similar, we'll look at age. And the one who is a more senior age, automatically you will feel more respect for him. So we will look at the one with more age. Okay. And the point is now, some of the books of fiqh go into uh, such ludicrous details, like what if they're the same, what if they're the same, and they go down 15 points. Okay, And it's never going to happen like this. Uh, so much so in some books of fiqh, just as a joke here, but I'm not joking, this is the way they have it, that if they're all the same, then the one who has the more wives and children, mashallah, tabarakallah, okay? So khalas, Hisham now wants to become the imam, mubasharatan, mashallah. You want an automatic upgrade, huh? but it doesn't matter because number one is what? Aqra'um li kitabillah, okay? So even if you have four and your quota is full, you will lose still, <laughs> okay? But then you have to do your Quran. Be good in Quran and you can trumpet, inshallah, and you don't need the four then. <laughs> so the point being there's no need to go into all of these details of how many overall who is the one who leads the salah the one who has the most respect islamically simple as that okay and the hadith mentions things that no longer exist the one who makes the earlier hijrah the one who accepts islam earlier because the sahaba all accepted islam at different timings so the one who accepted islam in the second year of mecca is not the same as the one who accepted Islam after Badr or after Fatah. There's levels of accepting Islam. And obviously this doesn't really apply to us now. By and large it doesn't apply, but still it could apply in that two converts. And they are both in the masjid and they are the ones that are... So who amongst them, if their Quran is similar, if they're, who amongst them converted earlier? Then we would apply the hadith. So the point is, anybody who has more respect in Islam, that is the one who uh, should lead the salah. And of course, the hadith itself says that no one should lead in the dominion or authority of another except with his permission. So if you are in somebody's house, then that trumps other factors as long as the Quran is acceptable because that the acceptability of reading can never be compromised because if you can't read the Quran then you're not going to be the imam okay as long as the Quran is acceptable so they know the basics of tajweed then that person even if he knows less Quran will have the authority to lead illa bi'idhnihi unless he delegates and this is the sunnah of our culture that the host always gives up to somebody who is worthy, but it must be from the host. Because that is his domain and authority. And this is of the beauty of the Sharia, that nobody should feel that in his own house, that somebody is in charge over him. So he feels dominion of his own house, and therefore he will be the one to delegate. And of course it is encouraged for him to delegate uh, the one who is more qualified. Um, So... uh, and then he goes on. وَلَا تَصِحُّ الصَّلَاةُ خَلْفَ مَنْ صَلَاتُهُ فَاسِدَةً إِلَّا لِمَنْ لَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِحَدَثِ نَفْسِهِ وَلَمْ يَعْلَمْهُ الْمَأْمُومُ حَتَّى سَلَّمْ فَإِنَّهُ يُعِيدُهُ وَحْدَهُ And it is not allowed to pray behind somebody whose salah itself is fasida. For example, if the person does not have wudu and you know he does not have wudu. Or if the person is a non-Muslim, for example. Or if the person is a group, a bid'a group whose bid'a is basically outside the fold of Islam. Okay? And there are examples that we have given of this, like groups that believe in a prophet after the Prophet Okay? If this person is leading the salah, it is not allowed to pray behind someone whose salah is fasid. And... This is really only one of two things. Number one, you know that he does not have one of the shurut. And this is difficult if not impossible, but nonetheless, if that's a theoretical scenario. Or number two, he is not a Muslim. Well, in fact, you can say one of the shurut of salah is he must be a Muslim. So it's kind of in the same thing. Okay. So if you happen to know this person is not qualified to lead at all, then... uh, 
you are not allowed to pray behind him. Now, however, this we're talking about somebody whose salah being fasted is not an ikhtilaf of fiqh. In other words, if it's fasted in your madhab but not in his madhab, then it is not fasted. Because this is amongst the madhahib. So, for example, in the Hanbali madhab, eating camel meat breaks the wudu. Okay, this is a fact. It's the only madhab that has this. That if you eat camel meat, it breaks the wudu. It's like going to the restroom. You break your wudu, right? Just by eating camel meat or drinking camel milk, even according to uh, the majority opinion. You, you eat or drink camel, your wudu is broken. Now, suppose there's Shafi and a Hanbali, and they both eat camel meat. Then the Hanbali has more Quran, so he goes in front to lead. Should the Shafi'i say, oh, your salah is batal, I cannot pray behind you? No. This is narrow-mindedness and intolerance and fanaticism. And the Sharia is opposed to this. Because in this case, the salah is not fasid for the Shafi'i. Correct? The salah is not fasid for the Shafi'i. I gave the other way around. The Shafi'i should be leading, I mean. Right? I gave the other round. Uh, the salah is not faster for the Shafi'i. That's the point here. And so the Hanbali should realize that the Shafi'i salah is valid for him. And therefore, it is valid for me. Is that clear? Right? So the Hanbali should not be so intolerant that he expects the Shafi'i to follow his opinion. But if it is something that unanimously agrees upon that this is goes against the salah, then it is not allowed to pray behind somebody whose salah is fasid, except, he said, that if the imam did not know himself that his wudu, he didn't have wudu, until the whole salah finishes. In this case, he doesn't have to tell the ma'mum, and the imam repeats his own salah, because this is accidental and unintentional. Okay? So this is not something that is the fault of the ma'mum. They didn't know, the imam didn't know. And therefore, the imam will make it up by himself. And it is not allowed to pray behind somebody who is leaving one of the arkan. So the first point, somebody is leaving one of the shurut. What if he's leaving one of the arkan? It is not allowed as well. That if somebody is leaving the arkan, and you know he's always leaving the arkan, you cannot pray behind him. Except in one condition. إِلَّا إِمَامُ الْحَيِّ إِذَا صَلَّى جَالِسًا لِمَرَضٍ يُرْجَى بُرْؤُهُ فَإِنَّهُمْ يُصَلُّونَ وَرَاءَهُ جُلُوسًا This is one of the unique things of the Hanbali Madhab. None of the others have this. That the only exception of an arkan being broken is if the imam of their locality, so somebody who is always leading usually anyway, okay, not a stranger, not somebody in a gathering and they chose this person, the regular imam falls sick and has to sit down and the sickness is temporary and eventually he'll be able to stand up in a few weeks or months. In this case, it is allowed for the imam to sit because one of the arkan is to stand. In this case, it is allowed for the imam to sit, but they must pray behind the imam sitting down. This is the Hanbali madhab. And only the Hanbali say this. And all the other three say they must be standing up. Or in fact, others would say such an imam should not even be the imam. But none of them say the whole jama'ah should pray sitting down other than the Hanbali uh, madhab. And of course, um, why do they, why do they uh, say this? They base it on the hadith I just mentioned. That's why I mentioned it. That the Prophet fell from his horse or camel and he prayed mm-hmm for a while sitting, and all of the Sahaba prayed sitting. But the majority say that this was an early Islam. And towards the end, this was abrogated by the hadith of Abu Bakr, that the Prophet was sitting. Abu Bakr was the one behind the Prophet next to him on the right-hand side. And the people could see Abu Bakr, and they followed him, even though he isn't the Imam. He is simply following the Prophet So the Prophet is sitting, and everybody is standing. Okay, so this demonstrates therefore that, and this is the majority opinion, and we have to disagree with the Hanbali Madhab here, and say if the Imam is sick, then the rest of the people will pray standing, not sitting down. Okay, and the Imam being sick does not disqualify him from being the Imam. So if the, and this is only for the regular Imam, 
Otherwise, if you're all ten brothers together, and one of them has fallen ill and he has a broken cast, he has to sit down. Generally, you would not want him to be the imam because you don't want the imam to be somebody who has to sit because that's going to cause awkwardness for the people behind. Okay, so generally, we would look over this person who is sick until their sickness is um, cured. ولا تصح إمامة المرأة بالرجال and it is not allowed for a woman to be the imam in front of men. This is explicit and there is unanimous consensus of the entire ummah of this uh, point and no scholar has ever differed that in the fard salah, a woman cannot lead the men. There is a very minority ikhtilaf that is found by some of the non-form adhahib that in nafil salah, a woman may lead the men of her house only uh, from the back and not from the front. Right, So she will be in the back and the men will be in front of her. If she is literate and they are, so there are so many conditions. And this is actually, if you think about it, now firstly, none of the four men have said this. This is found, and how do we all know this, by the way? How do I even know this? Because of all of the fitna of women leading and whatnot. So those the, the ladies that did it, they didn't do any research, they just wanted to do it. Then the second tier of those ladies came and they basically dug deeper and deeper and deeper to find some type of precedent. And so they made this a, a well-known fact for those of, of, of us in those arenas and circles. And they said that it, some of the madhabs allowed a woman to lead. And they shocked us all, like, what do you mean some of the madhabs allowed? We never heard this. So we went back to the books, we looked up, and in fact they are correct, but they exaggerated and they distorted and they covered up. It is true that one of the scholars, At-Tabari, the famous At-Tabari, who was not a great faqih, he was a historian and a mufassir, but he had some fiqh views. At-Tabari had the position, in, in a certain circumstance, if the woman of the house is educated and literate, and she has, let's say, slaves who are illiterate, because a very common scenario, imagine though a servants who are illiterate. In the nafil, like for example, taraweeh, it is permitted for her to be leading them. So the men of her household, not the men of the neighborhood. The men of her household, if she knows and they don't know how to read, then she may lead them in nafil salah only. This was opinion he, hold, he held, and it is true he held it. For this group to take this and then say Jum'ah Salah and, and, uh, and uh, praying men and women together, you see how they pick and choose what they want to. And that's typical for the progressive and the ultra-feminists. This is exactly what we expect of them. They're not consistent or fair. This is not what Tabari said. But they take that point and they then do their Jum'ah Salah and whatnot. But the point is that even this position, it was rejected by the others. And they would say that the men should pray on their own and the women should pray uh, on their own just because... She knows more, doesn't mean she will be the imam. So the four madhahib have agreed. In fact, there is ijma amongst all the scholars that the fard salah, a woman cannot lead the men. And we have it explicit in the text here. وَلَا تَصِحُ إِمَامَةُ الْمَرْأَةِ بِالرِّجَالِ It is not valid for a woman to be the imam of men. It is also not valid for a person who has salasu al to be the imam. And salasu al means incontinence. So the one whose wudu is constantly breaking, okay, uncontrollable, so this person should not be the imam because obviously he is excused. How about us behind him? We don't want this for the imam. Okay? And this applies to any other type of sickness that affects his salah. That affecting of his salah is forgiven for him. But he should not be the imam for others in salah. Okay, because again, the imam should be somebody who is as perfect amongst us Islamically and the arkan and shirut are fulfilled. Another person who cannot be the imam, وَالْأُمِّي الَّذِي لَا يُحْسِنُ الْفَاتِحَةِ أَوْ يَخِلُّ بِحَرْفٍ مِنْهَا إِلَّا بِمِثْلِهِمْ The ummi, and ummi here means not just illiterate, but the one who doesn't know how to read the Qur'an even if he's educated in 20 languages, but not in the tajweed of the Qur'an. He is ummi for us. Ummi doesn't mean unlettered. Ummi here means the one who cannot recite the Qur'an. Even if he has a PhD in astronomical sciences, 
but he doesn't know the Quran. He is ummi from the Sharia's perspective for the Imam. Because what do we care about? You can be illiterate in reading and writing. Your tajweed can be the best in the world. So many of our Qurra, they didn't know how to read and write. But their tajweed is flawless. That's not ummi. That's qari. So ummi opposite of qari. So the ummi who cannot read the fatiha or makes a mistake even in one letter regularly cannot be the imam except if the congregation is all to his level. This is a very good <coughs> exceptional clause here. Okay? Except if the congregation is to his level, then they are excused. Because what else do you want them to do? So, a group of people come together and none of them have studied tajweed. And they're all making major mistakes. In this case, they are forgiven. And they choose the one whom they think is the best and bismillah, they can go for it. Otherwise, it is not allowed for the ummi who makes a mistake even in one letter. Because we all know one letter changes the meaning. Right? All of you even learning basic Arabic, qalb to kalb. What are the contrast in meaning? How can you give the Quranic recitation to somebody who's going to change your qalb into a kalb? Think about it, right? It's, and so many other easy mistakes can be done that literally changes it from iman to kufr, right? From shirk to tawheed, tawheed to shirk, from something that is noble to something that's a joke and a mockery. How can you give the Quran recitation to somebody? doesn't matter how respected he is in the community. If he doesn't know the Quranic recitation, should not be leading. Okay? So this is explicit and all the madahib say this, that whoever makes a mistake, and that's why, I mean, even I have to say personally with myself, I'm very particular about this as well, that I, I cannot, um, I don't like praying behind anybody who does not know how to recite properly. It's something that my whole khushu' is gone and it's something I find very, and that's why even for the, the, the tarawih prayers, I'm very picky about who we get. Uh, that's his tajweed has to be uh, very good. Even if the voice is not as good, I know some of you don't agree with this position of mine, but for me, the tajweed has to be flawless because what is important is tajweed. And we, unfortunately, many of us, we don't care about tajweed, we care about a good voice, a melodious voice. And there are many people who have a good voice, but they haven't practiced the rules. And their makharij, their pronunciations are incorrect, but their voice is melodious to the ear that's not trained. The trained ear, by the way, will never like non-Tajweed voice. That's true. That is true. The community doesn't have that education. That's true. But, I mean, uh, for me, for the five years I've been here, I've been very strict. That anybody we get has to be a person who knows his Tajweed uh, and no mistakes in Tajweed. Uh, and uh, that's a position that I, I cannot compromise on. Uh, if I'm going to be in any community, then the, the person has to know the Jaweed. In any case, the point being that this is very clear, that even in the, the fiqh books it says, even if there's one harf he makes a mistake in, that person should not be the imam. And you all understand why. It's common sense. You don't even need Quran or Hadith. You will change the meanings of what you're reciting if you don't know how to recite one letter properly. And how many are the Arabic letters whose makharij are very close, right? How many? Look at the law and the va and the za and the si. So many, you need to know exactly what you're saying. And therefore, even if one harf is mistaken, he cannot be the imam unless the whole community is the same. Then they are forgiven and they can choose somebody of that level. Okay, we now move on. Who else? What other issues come with imam? How about, so we're trying to say that certain people should not be the imam. How about if there's other problems such as the uh, so, okay. How about if the one who knows the most Quran for some reason has to do tayammum and the rest of the jama'ah is on wudu with water? In this case, we say that tayammum and wudu, if he did it with proper excuse, they are the same. So, the one who does, and this is all, by the way, the finer details of fiqh. And the other madahib will have their priority. So what trumps what when it comes to being the imam? So for example, uh, and by the way, I remember when I was studying in Medina, so one of my teachers said, you know, these are all issues we need to relook at. So what if we find a person in a wheelchair who knows good Quran and good recitation, why can't he be the imam? 
uh, in this case. So he was like, what's the big deal? We need to rethink this through. Maybe at some societies and times when there were a lot of negativity with invalids, maybe we understand. Now these things are changing. So the hadith doesn't mention standing versus sitting. The hadith mentions aqra'uhum li kitabillah and the one who knows the more sunnah and the one so these are the ones set in stone no question the one who has the better quran then the one who knows more sharia these are like they said but then the other details what trumps what these are all where the madahi will differ and the hanbali madhab we already gave some examples they said the one who has salasul bowl uh, the one who has the incontinence uh, should not be the imam the one who has uh, a cast on the leg should not be the imam. Uh, in fact, in some Hanbali books, it says the one who is blind uh, or one eye should not be the imam. But this goes against explicitly the fact that at times, uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum would lead the Sahaba in salah when the Prophet was not there. right? But then they reasoned that, but that's because the city was empty, because this was in Tabuk or something. And there were just a few men, and amongst them, Ibn Umm Maktoum was the best. But so the point is, they go back and forth, and in reality, this is an area we don't have to be that strict in. The main criterion, أَقْرَأُهُمْ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ and then أَعْلَمُهُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ This is the main criterion. And in my humble opinion, other issues are all secondary. And these are all اختلاف the madahib. So the Hanbali madhab says, the one who has tayammum should lead if he has more Qur'an, even if the other people are on wudu. So his tayammum doesn't make him one level below the rest of the people with wudu. Clear? Okay? And they, they base this, of course, on uh, the fact that uh, the, the one who does tayammum, it is as if he has done wudu. Tayammum is his tahara. Tayammum is his tahara. And if he has an excuse, he's sick, he has a skin disease, he could not find water for some reason, the rest of the group is still upon wudu. So he's excused. And in reality his tayammum will count as his wudu. So he's the same level as them. And this is a valid point, actually. Then the Hanbali say, وَيَجُوزُ إِمَامَةُ الْمُفْتَرِضِ بِالْمُتَنَفِّلِ The one who is praying the fard can pray behind somebody who is praying the nafil. Now, the opposite, everybody allows. The opposite is what? The imam is praying fard and the one behind praying nafil. This is pretty much everybody allows it. That for some reason, we just gave an example. You prayed fajr, you come to the masjid, they're praying fajr. What did the Prophet himself say? Explicit. He said, it will count as nafil for you. So we have no problem with that. Okay? So the opposite, no ikhtilaf. This scenario, we have a big divide amongst the madahib. Because one group will argue, the one who's praying fard has a higher level. So how could the imam who's praying nafil lead the ma'moom who's praying fard? Okay? But the Hanbalis explicitly, explicitly say what? Wayajuz. It is allowed for the one who's praying nafil to be the imam for the one who's praying fard. Meaning, if you look amongst yourselves and fulan has the most Quran, he should be the imam even if he has already prayed that same salah as his fard. Okay? So you're following the Hanbali position. The Hanafis would not allow this. You're following the Hanbali position. This is what we are teaching in the masjid as well. And the evidence of the Hanbalis is the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim muttafaq alayhi. That Mu'adh ibn Jabal would lead his people in Isha after he had prayed Isha with the Prophet And he would go to his masjid and lead them in Isha. So he has prayed the fard. And then he goes to his masjid and he's leading them in their fard. And guess what? It is his nafil. Okay, so this is an explicit, authentic evidence. And that's why it seems to be clearly the stronger opinion. And the ones who oppose it don't have any hadith. It's like common sense. And hadith trumps what you think is common sense. If there's an explicit hadith, then we don't bring in any type of logic or reason. We say, khalas, this is allowed. And the Prophet explicitly allowed that the one who is praying nafil should, uh, is allowed to lead the fard salah. Okay, so... 
the one who does tayammum and the one who is praying nafil, they can be the imam. This is ignored in the criterion process. What do we look at? Quran and Sunnah and ilm and whatnot. So the one who knows the most Quran, even if he's praying nafil, go ahead be the imam. The one who knows the most Quran, even if he's on tayammum, go ahead and be the imam. Okay. Now, where do they stand in relation to one another? وَإِذَا كَانَ الْمَأْمُومُ وَاحِدًا وَقَفَ عَنْ يَمِينَ الْإِمَامِ If there's only one ma'moom, he will stand on the right-hand side of the imam. Okay, and we just mentioned the hadith of who? Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas was the nephew. He was the cousin of the Prophet and the nephew of. Go ahead, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Maymuna. Maymuna, right? Maymuna was the khala of Ibn Abbas. Okay? And the Prophet is his uncle, uh, is his cousin. So Ibn Abbas was a young boy, and one night he wanted to visit his aunt, and so he uh, ended up sleeping. In the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And in those days they only have one bedroom And so he said I slept on one direction And my khala and the Prophet ﷺ slept on another direction Okay, he's a young child, 7-8 years old And uh, they gave him permission to sleep And it is allowed, he is the mahram In any case, in any case he's a young boy So he slept in this way And the Prophet ﷺ, Maymun is sleeping this way Then uh, he woke up to see the Prophet ﷺ in tahajjud and this is amazing, a young, little kid, subhanAllah, right? Little boy, he stood up, sleepy, did his wudu, and he jumped to be praying behind the Prophet wasallam. But he didn't know which side, and so he went to the left. And so the Prophet held on to him, and put him from behind, and took him, and made him stand to his right. Okay, so this hadith, therefore, and all the madahib agree, if there's two people, then... The ma'moom stands to the right. Now, some ulama say, and this is not anything from the hadith, but it is still even in this case, sunnah for the imam to be a little bit ahead of the ma'moom. And others say they should be feet to feet in this case. And the fact of the matter is both positions can be read into. Both positions can be read into. We can't be sure, did Ibn Abbas stand feet to feet, or was he just a little bit behind? And so whatever one does, inshaAllah ta'ala, it is permissible. Whatever one does, it is inshaAllah ta'ala um, permissible. So if there's only two, then they will stand on the right-hand side. The Imam Musa on the right-hand side. And if he stands on the left, or in front, or by himself, then this is not valid. It is not valid to stand on the left or by himself or in front of the um, imam. And they based this on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he saw a man praying all by himself in the saf and the Prophet commanded him to repeat the uh, salah. And this is a big controversy about praying by yourself in the saf and I mentioned this in my Q&A when we did it and um, even though many of the madahib say that, that in such a case the man should not pray by himself. The reality is that there doesn't seem to be any evidence to suggest that somebody should be pulled behind. Uh, and it doesn't make sense. What has that guy done that he deserves to be dragged behind? What is his fault in doing so? And therefore, in this case, you are forgiven. But you should not be in a saf by yourself without an excuse. In other words, if there's space, you cannot be in a saf by yourself. Okay? Then he says, the only exception, if there's only one woman then she will stand by herself. Okay? So obviously the sufuf of the men and the sufuf of the women do not go uh, in the same row. So the woman will be behind the men. And if there's only one woman, she will be in her own saf, no problem over there. Uh, so, and then, um, if there is a group of men, they will pray behind the imam. Everybody agrees with this. If for some reason they stood to his right 
or they were on his right and left, this would be valid. So if, uh, and this has happened by the way, especially in America, you go to a musalla area and at times it's just in such a weird way that you know you might start praying with one or two people and then more and more, more and more people come and they have to go to your right. And even in people's houses, this has happened many times. That you, So he is saying in this case, if they are praying all to his right for some reason, so there's no space to have two sufuf. Or on his right and left, this is valid. But if they pray all to his left or in front of him, this is invalid. Common sense. That the imam should be in front or to the right. Okay? Common sense. That the imam should be the one who has the right hand. And therefore, if it so happens that there's five people and they can only form one saf, then the imam is either in the middle and three or two, or two or three, or if it happens that he has to be on one side, then they will all be on his right hand side. Okay, so the imam will pray and the rest will be on his right hand side. What is not allowed is of course for the people to be in front of the imam or for them to be all on the left hand of the imam. Now, um, the controversy occurs that what if the circumstances uh, do not allow except for some of the sufu being in front of the imam, is their salah batil or not? And this is a controversy in classical fiqh and in modern fiqh. And inshallah ta'ala, in my opinion, if the circumstances call for it, then the salah is valid. Uh, and the simple example of this is the men's prayer versus the women's prayer in another area. A lot of times, their prayer hall, if you look at the angle of the qibla or whatever, and you draw the angle out, sometimes the women's rows might actually be in front of the imam. But they're in a separate room. And this is a common problem in North America, right? You understand, like if you're standing in one direction and you draw a line parallel to you with the qibla, in fact, the, the woman might actually be ahead of you in this case. Or you're praying in the men's sitting room area and it so happens the qibla is in the other direction and the woman's sitting room area is over there in front and they can hear you. There's no visual problem but they can they can hear you so can they pray behind your voice or not many madahib would say no and they just pray on their own but inshallah i've done some research it in my position that there's no evidence to suggest that the salah is batil rather the general norm should be that the imam should be in front and that is clearly the norm but if for some specific reason the imam cannot be in front and an exceptional scenario arises, the salah is not batil. It is against the norm, it is makru, but the salah is jaiz. And if the women decide they don't want to pray with the jama'ah, they want to pray separate, that too is jaiz. Okay? Moving on, we have only four lines left and we're done inshallah ta'ala. If a woman leads other women in salah, then she stands, as we all know, where does she stand? In the middle. She stands in the middle amongst them. So the woman does not lead in front. Even other women, she does not lead in front. She leads in the same sufuf as the other uh, women. And hypothetical scenario, but again, this is the point of fiqh, as we said, is that these scenarios are meant for you to think, not necessarily to apply. That suppose if there was a group of men, all of them naked, Without any clothes. Okay? In this case as well, the Imam is not going to be in front, will be in the middle amongst them. And as I mentioned, was it five weeks ago, four weeks ago, the books of fiqh always have these hypothetical scenarios to get you thinking that if there is a legitimate reason that you would not want the Imam forward. So I don't think ever in the history of the Ummah a group of naked men have been traveling and they have to have jama'ah together. But the point is, other scenarios might arise. And you knowing this hypothetical scenario, you can then make qiyas for the scenario that you might actually be uh, having. Okay, And so if a scenario arises where you might have to change or move it back and forth, then extenuating circumstances allow the imam to be in the uh, middle. And if there's a group of men 
and women and khuntha uh, and khuntha are those who are uh, born with both genders, okay? Uh, they are uh, trans, if you like. They are the one, and by trans, we don't mean the one who choose because there's types of trans. We mean the ones who are born with both genders. And this is hermaphrodite is the technical term for it. Um, and these are rare, uh, but they do exist. And in our times, science can pretty much not solve the problem, but eliminate the hermaphrodite problem in that you will, when you are born in this way, the, the doctors will automatically perform surgery and one of the organs will basically be gotten rid of. And you will then have the other organ for the rest of your life. And that is what the Sharia requires, by the way. The Sharia requires that this binary distinction remain in contrast to what modern people are saying where you have other multiple identities. But anyway, that's besides the point. If you have a group of men and children and women and hermaphrodites, again, the hypothetical, because how are you going to know all of these? But the point is that fiqh should teach you these things. You first have the rijal, the men, then the children, then the hermaphrodites, then the women. Okay, so the hermaphrodites would be in the middle. And by the way, a situation did come up uh, where um, a masjid, um, in one of the states here, they called me up and they said that we have a convert, we have a convert who, before converting to Islam, had a sex change operation. Before converting to Islam, had a sex change operation. And the question was now, where would this convert stand in the salah? Okay, so this is a forgiven issue because this person did it before accepting Islam. Okay, now this person has accepted Islam and um, so it was a man who had become a woman. And uh, the women felt very uncomfortable because obviously they had never experienced this before and they were causing some issues and whatnot. So they reached out to me and what is to be done. And we, I said, you know, the books of fiqh, so, you know, we're laughing at this, for example, theoretical example. Look what now. SubhanAllah, instantaneously, I was like, you know, this is classical fiqh. I don't need to go to any fatwa for you. This is classical fiqh that this person will be in the women's section in the front, in her own saf. She will be in the front. Because the operation has been done. So he is now a she. There is no he left, if you get my point. Okay? So he is now a she. So she will be in the women's section. But she will not be just like the other women. She will be treated as a khuntha, even though technically she's not the type of khuntha that existed in the good old days. But nonetheless, she is not fully she. So she will be at the head of the women's section in a soft on her own, and the women can be behind her. Okay, and they solved the problem. But so, and I bring this up, why? To illustrate these hypothetical scenarios are very important. And the fuqaha put them in so that we have an understanding and we can immediately go back to them when need be. Okay, and then we finish this chapter with two simple phrases, both of them very easy. وَمَنْ كَبَّرَ قَبْلَ سَلَامِ الْإِمَامِ فَقَدْ أَدْرَكَ الْجَمَاعَةِ وَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ الرُّكُوعِ فَقَدْ أَدْرَكَ الرَّكْعَةِ وَإِلَّا فَلَا Okay, simple, and then we finish this chapter. Whoever says the takbir before the imam says salam gets the jama'ah of the imam. And whoever catches the ruku' at the rak'ah or before the rak'ah has caught the rak'ah. Very simple. And this is pretty much the standard position of all of the madhahib. Standard position of all of the madhahib. That if you catch the imam before the taslim, then you are a part of the jama'ah. But you will only catch the rak'ah at the ruku'ah. You have to have the ruku'ah, then you will be considered as having the rak'ah. And this is uh, the standard position because of what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that, and this is an authentic hadith in Bukhari, uh, whoever gets the ruku' has caught the rak'ah. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you walk in and the imam is in the final tashahud, a lot of people say, I'm not going to join 
and I'll wait for the second jama'ah. And this is wrong. Because you joining with the first jama'ah will get you the rewards of the first jama'ah. And that is more important. And you not joining the jama'ah has multiple problems. Of them is the explicit prohibition of standing when the jama'ah is going on. You are never supposed to cut yourself off from the jama'ah. And therefore it is a mistake and it should be corrected. If you see somebody that is just loitering in the back and he thinks that he's doing something good by waiting for the imam to give salam, this is multiple problems because then we get to the other controversy. Should we even have a second jama'ah in the masjid? Which is another point of controversy. And as we said, once in a while it is overlooked, but the general norm is that no, there should not be two jama'ahs in the masjid. This is the norm because we don't want to encourage people to come late and to have that those jama'at. It's one thing if it's in your house. It's one thing if it's in the musalla, that is the musalla in the road. In Arab lands or in Muslim lands, you have little masjids on the highways. That's understood. But in a masjid like ours, there should be specific timings and everybody should know. And if you don't get those timings, the general rule should be we do not have another jama'ah. It's not wrong to have a second jama'ah, but it is not right either. In the masjid, there should be one formal jama'ah. That's the purpose of there being a masjid. And to make it a habit to always make a second jama'ah, I've said this many, many times. In fact, many of the ulama say there is no second jama'ah. The Hanafis in particular would say this batil. The salah is not even valid. They would say that if you have a second jama'ah, but I'm not going to that extent. I'm not at all saying it is batil, but I'm saying that this opens the door uh, for the community splitting up, for being lazy, for the jama'ah not being given the status it deserves, and it should not be made into a habit. Uh, with that, are there any quick questions before we break? And I know I have some from the online. Yes. So this is, uh, if, if the imam, if the ma'moom did not catch the rak'ah, and he simply caught the last taslim, yeah, so he caught the last taslim. He did not catch any rak'ah. Insha'Allah ta'ala, it is acceptable for this person to be the imam. Because he did not catch a rak'ah. But how would the person coming in late know this? Okay. Also, we get to the controversy of should there be a second jama'ah. And that's another controversy. If the person caught one rak'ah, then he takes the hukum of the ma'moom. And as the ma'moom, he cannot become the imam of somebody else. He has to finish his own salah. So in this case, really, the best thing to do is not have a second jama'ah anyway, much less tap somebody and then start another jama'ah. We have some questions from on online as well. And that is that um, somebody says that when somebody joins the prayer late and he catches the last rak'ah or the last two rak'at, are the last rak'at his first or are they his last? And this is a classic controversy in the fiqh books. And uh, both opinions have evidences from the sunnah. But insha'Allah ta'ala, what makes more sense is that the, his first rak'at, which is the imam's last rak'ah, will count as his first rak'at. Some scholars say that he should consider the imam's rak'ah to be his rak'ah. So if the imam is in the third rak'ah, he is actually praying the third rak'ah and fourth rak'ah, then he makes up the first two. Okay? It's confusing, it's illogical, and it will mess your mind up anyway. So, inshallah, the, 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 and this goes back to how you understand, وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَقْضُوا what does it mean? فَأَتِمُّ and فَقْضُ There's two versions of the hadith, right? وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّ You complete what's remaining. وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَقْضُ What you missed, make up what you missed. Right? Both hadith are there. So, do you have to make itmam? Do you have to make qada? Both versions are there. And in the end of the day, it's possible to interpret both of them to mean you finish up what is remaining for you to finish up. Um, so uh, the issue of Raf'ul Yadain is coming that some of the brothers do Raf'ul Yadain when they stand up from the third rak'ah. Um, 
Should they do this or not? Uh, these are from the nafil or the sunan of the salah. If somebody does it, that is fine. If somebody doesn't do it, that is fine. Some ahadith do mention that when the Prophet stood up from the second rak'ah, he would do raf'ul yadain. So this is what they base this on. Um, not reading Surah Al-Fatiha in salah, is it only for the out loud prayer or only for the silent prayers? As I said, the position that I'm now, now teaching, and maybe in a few years I'll go back to the other position. When the imam is silent, then you read Surah Al-Fatiha. And when the imam is reciting out loud, then you listen quietly and don't read. And this is uh, the majority position. Only the Shafi'is have another position. The three madhahib uh, all say this. The three madhahib all agree that when the imam is reciting out loud, then you stay quiet and do not read Fatiha. And uh, when the imam cannot be heard, then uh, the Hanbalis and one version of the Malikis, they say you can recite Fatiha on your own. So when you don't hear the imam, then you recite Fatiha. And that's what I'm saying as well. Uh, question is that, uh, is it true that we cannot pray in the graveyard? Yes, we mentioned this in the arkan of the Salah. I said in the Shurut of the Salah that the, the Salah should not be prayed in the graveyard and also in the restrooms. These are the two places that the Salah should not be prayed. Uh, and the final question from online, we have uh, that... Uh, if I make a mistake and I recite a surah after Surah Al-Fatiha in the third or the fourth rak'ah, what do I do? What do we do? I went over this issue. Pray the whole prayer again? Which madhab is this? Huh? Sajid al-Sahu? This is what happens when you don't take notes. It's not wajib, it's not rukun, so nothing. He doesn't do anything. It's not, he doesn't do anything because even if he didn't recite in the first and second rak'ah an extra surah, he wouldn't make it up with Sajid al-Sahu. So how about if he added an extra surah by mistake? It would not be any problem. Okay? Yes, go ahead. No, we said very clearly. We said very clearly, where does the woman stand at all timing? The woman always stands on the own, on her own. It doesn't matter if it's mahram or sister, brother, it doesn't matter. The woman will stand in her own saf. That's what we went over in the salah. Inshallah, we will... Yes. Uh, so on Saturday at Woodlands Hills, what time? 6 to 9 p.m. There will be a fundraiser for our uh, brothers and sisters of Syrian refugees. And buy the ticket as well, and they will be available, inshallah ta'ala, today and on Friday, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, go ahead. Some graveyards have masjids. Um, if the graveyard is outside the masjid, and it's not a part of the masjid, this is something separate. But if the graveyard and the masjid were linked together, such that the masjid was built because of the grave, or the person was buried inside the masjid, then we have a problem. And something should be done about that by the authorities. Yeah, so here we we'd make a distinction. Was the graveyard built simply because it was convenient and there was open land outside the masjid, in which case it is permissible. Or was the person buried because of the masjid and he got special treatment and they wanted to give him a burial that he was a person of holiness. This is the point here. It is common in many Muslim lands that they have a plot and they have to take one corner as the masjid and one corner or one area as the graveyard. And there's a distinction between the two. On the right-hand side, the masjid, on the left-hand side, or something like this. And to this day, if you go to many cities, you will find the graveyard and the masjid close by one another. But they are not built for each other. It's just a matter of convenience. Okay? But that nobody prays there five times a day. But let's be realistic here in our MIC. If we were to have a plot of land, which we are hoping one day maybe to have, right? That we have our own plot of land here. 
So would this be haram? Of course not. Because we are building a convenient place. It's not meant to be. But suppose in the, some Muslim land, a person died who was a wali, a saint, or whatnot, and they said, oh, he should be buried next to the masjid, and there is no graveyard. They make an exception for this person. Or the other way around, that this is the qabr of so-and-so. So we should build a masjid, and there is no masjid. And they build the masjid because of the qabr of so-and-so. This is when it would become problematic. Okay? Otherwise, if it just happens because of land issues, and all the Muslims are buried there, this is not inherently a problem. Inshallah. Okay, so inshallah we will. Yeah, the Masjid al is an example of this, that it was not intended. It just happened as an historical reality that the Masjid expanded in that direction. Otherwise, the Prophet was buried outside his, his Masjid as we mentioned. Inshallah.